Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Lise Altshuler. Uh, many of you know her well, but for those of you who are new to the program, uh, Lise is Professor of Clinical Medicine at the University of Arizona, where she is the Associate Director of the Fellowship in the Program of Integrative Medicine. Uh, Dr. Altshuler obtained her naturopathic medical degree from Bastyr University, which is where she also completed her residency in general naturopathic medicine. Uh, she uh, is board certified in that as well as in uh, naturopathic oncology. She's co-authored uh, two books, one The Definitive Guide to Cancer and The Definitive Guide to Thriving After Cancer. Uh, we also may know her for her educational site, uh, TAP Integrative, and for various podcasts. I appreciate her for her vast knowledge of integrative health and her willingness to share that with us. And so it's only fitting that um, in this uh, gathering on, with the theme of resiliency that she's going to speak to us today on dietary supplements for resiliency. Thank you, Dr. Alshuler, for being with us. Good to see you. My pleasure. <clears throat> so that introduction, I appreciate it very much. And just so that you are not disappointed in what I'm going to present, I am going to include dietary supplements, but that's really not all that I'm going to speak about. I was asked to speak about resiliency. And so I want to talk to you about resiliency and weave in dietary supplements, but really from a more broad, integrated perspective. So with no further ado, so I want to talk to you about happiness. And I have a firm belief that happiness is the antidote to professional burnout. And um, so I want to just kind of take you through my thought process on this. And I do have some disclosures. These are all companies that I have given presentations for and received compensation for those or received research funding. Um, other than money making me a little bit happy, I don't think I have any conflicts in this presentation per se. So here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about uh, the symptoms of burnout briefly. I want to talk about the attributes and the neurochemistry of happiness. And then I want to take you through a little self-reflection by way of my self-reflection on the, some of the key contributors to happiness. And then I want to talk about some dietary supplements uh, to facilitate or grease the skids, as I like to say, for happiness. So today's practice of medicine if you think about what we do, it's crazy. Everything is oriented around complaint. We talk about patients coming in, and the first thing we do is find out what their chief complaint is. So everything we do is oriented around what's wrong, what doesn't work, what can I fix? And yes, that's appropriate, but in doing that and in focusing on what's wrong, we reinforce weakness. So the entire practice of medicine, in my opinion, is completely skewed to focus on what's unwell. unwell. And I feel like we have an opportunity to transform the practice of medicine, yes, in many ways through the principles and practice of integrative medicine, to, yes, include the alleviation of suffering, which is our duty as physicians, but to also establish and give people the potential to establish deeply exuberant living. And when we do that, we ourselves as practitioners experience the same and restore our own wellness. So I think fundamentally the antidote, if you will, to burnout is nothing short of transforming how we practice medicine. <laughs> so is this what your practice looks like? My sister went to Cuba and this is taken from a National Geographic magazine that was dedicated to the idea of happiness. These are people just dancing it up. And uh, my sister went to Cuba and she said everywhere she went, there was music. And people would strike up music in cafes, on the street, in their homes. And as soon as people started hearing music, they would just get up and start dancing. And that sense of being on the verge of exuberance is something very antithetical to how our culture is set up. So how about this? Is this what your practice looks like? I mean, I have to admit, I haven't gotten quite this far yet that I'm actually laughing my head off as I'm taking somebody's blood pressure, but what a different way to practice medicine with this sense of joy and freedom and love and compassion for one another and for our patients. 
So if this is not how our practices are, then I think we owe ourselves the question of why not? And, you know, maybe we feel exhausted and disempowered. Maybe we're not doing what we actually want to do. Maybe we're just too hard on ourselves to be happy, never mind cultivate happiness in our patients. Maybe we feel unworthy of being happy and maybe there's a little bit or a lot of all of the above and there's probably other things that get in our way too. These are good self-reflective questions. I think it's important to continually examine <clears throat> what it is that's standing between how we are practicing now, if it doesn't feel great, and where we could be practicing. Now, there are certain challenges that the pandemic has uh, laid upon us, and we know that a third of frontline healthcare workers are very distressed. During pandemic, of course, it makes sense. People are concerned about their own exposure to the virus. They have to neglect their personal and family needs in order to meet the excruciatingly high needs of patients. Everything's different, workload, skill sets, schedules. They often don't have PPE or necessary tools to do their jobs. <clears throat> Many providers are feeling very powerless given the amount of death and uh, morbidity that they're seeing. And frankly, there's an uncertainty about the future that infects how we approach our work. So this has all built up and continued to build up. We're seeing some release with the vaccine, but this is still very real for a lot of us. And when we're distressed and burned out, we start to experience some of these things more often. We start to get irritable, even angry. We might feel more anxiety. Our motivation for our work, for our family life goes down. We're tired, we're depressed, we're feeling overwhelmed. Our motivation is low, not only lack, but low. We might use more alcohol, drug, tobacco. So these are things that I think are obviously more happening more so among healthcare providers. So a lot of practitioners, I think, just think, well, gosh, the healthcare system should solve this problem for us. And um, there was a really interesting review that was just published by the Cochrane Database, and it was called Interventions to Support Resilience and Mental Health of Frontline Health and Social Care Professionals During and After a Disease Outbreak, Epidemic or Pandemic, a Mixed Method Systematic Review. So they had some interesting conclusions. They said, first of all, they were pretty confident that there were two big barriers to having the healthcare system solve this problem for us. One was that the workers or the organizations in which we work are not really aware of what we need to support our mental health. So we don't really know what we want. The other thing is that there is generally a lack of equipment, staff time, or skills needed for interventions when they're identified as potentially successful. So those are pretty big barriers. Uh, the <clears throat> review also <clears throat> concluded that there were three things that could facilitate um, helping people to gain resilience through uh, intervention. One is that the intervention was adapted to local needs or it made sense for the people that were the recipients of the intervention, that having good communication both formally and socially was important, and that the learning environment for these workers was positive, safe, and supportive. These are things I think that most of us would agree don't, we don't really experience very often in standard healthcare, but certainly when they're in place, lay the groundwork for, yes, the healthcare system solving the problem for us. And ultimately, the review concluded that we are moderately confident that the knowledge or beliefs or both that people have about an intervention can act as either barriers or facilitators to implementation of the intervention. So this I find very profound because this really puts the responsibility for alleviating our own suffering squarely with us and our own willingness to move from wherever we're at forward. And so that's really sets up the rest of my talk. And I uh, was very interested in this several years ago and I started to do kind of a deep dive into positive psychology. And some of you I'm sure are more experts in this than I, but I love positive psychology. This is such an incredible, branch of psychology because it's the scientific study of what works, what ordinary people possess that allows them to leave what positive psychologists call the good life, which is basically a life that <clears throat> is satisfying, well-lived, and fulfilling. 
So they study what works instead of what doesn't work, or they focus on what's right instead of what's wrong. This is in direct opposition to how most of psychology functions. They too ask people, what's wrong with you? How can I help what, what's you know, not working in your life? So they too focus on what's wrong for the most part, just like we do. And I think this is a very uh, courageous and dramatic um, difference in how we can look at health and humankind. And they've come up as a result of this study with some really interesting findings. And um, we're going to go through those in a moment. But first, I want to explore a little bit uh, more about this idea of happiness and just make sure we're more or less on the same page. So for me, happiness includes very much this concept of resilience, which is what Mari asked me to focus on. And I like this definition of resilience, which is a dynamic, multifactorial process in which an individual can adjust to adversity maintain equilibrium, retain some sense of control over their environment, and continue to move on in a positive manner. So that to me is a very key component of happiness, and I'll get into some more ways to understand happiness. Um, first of all, according to the positive psychology folks, happiness is not a state of being, it's a practice. So it's really a way to engage in behaviors that allow you to allow one to experience emotions that we often call positive and I'm using air quotes because I'll continue to, to say positive and negative but they're not really negative or positive but just a good shorthand I think so when we put certain things into practice we might experience things like joy happiness satisfaction love contentment more often and importantly the absence of negative emotions doesn't necessarily mean positive emotions plop in. Now, this is really important for us to do a really deep self-reflection on. How many times have we, and I'm guilty of this, assumed that if I come up with an appropriate and successful strategy in my patient to alleviate their anxiety or to get rid of their depression, they will be happy. It doesn't work that way. Happiness doesn't just fill in where depression left off. And in fact, we need both to coexist. We are always in this dynamic continuum. I had a counselor once who I think expressed this really well. She said, you know, we need periods of depression in order to dive to the very depths of our soul to pick up the treasures at the bottom. And yet we don't want to get stuck and drowned in our depression. We need to reemerge back to the surface of our life, holding those treasures and bring those into our life. Depression gives us a vantage point that allows us to renew our commitment to life in a very different and profound way. So we need both anxiety and depression, and we also need, of course, the other, exuberance, joy, contentment, etc. So uh, positive psychologists have talked about um, happiness as being a practice that encompasses the ability to recognize and experience these positive emotions, to practice self-acceptance. People that are happier tend to have a priority on their personal growth and a sense of autonomy in their lives. They uh, tend to have good uh, sort of fulfilling relationships. They uh, often are in service of others in, in one way or another. And importantly, they nurture a sense of hope, which really means they feel they have some sense of agency or some sense of control over something in their own future. So these are all kind of components of happiness. So I have a little happiness proposal that I put together, and this is very simple, but I think one could say that happiness maybe is the ability to love oneself and accept oneself combined with the courage to both feel loved and to love others. And that with those two very sometimes difficult things, one can experience happiness. Uh, Dan Buettner, who many of you are familiar with, the author of The Blue Zones of Happiness, defines happiness as three different strands of happiness that braid together in complementary ways to create lasting joy, these being pleasure, purpose, and pride. I like that a lot. There's an amazing healer and uh, somebody who's just really a phenomenal human being called Petraea King in Australia. And she defines what she calls the four C's of happiness. She talks about <clears throat> happiness being only able, you only are able to experience happiness when 
Number one, you, con you have control over our responses to life. So we choose to respond to something instead of simply mindfully reacting to the circumstances around us. She talks about a commitment to living, which means nourishing ourselves on all levels and really treating every moment that we're in as a living moment full of potential to be different, to show up in a different way. She then talks about creating meaning, which is about being in alignment with our core values. And she shared a quote, which I'll come back to again, because I love it so much, which she learned from a patient, which is that forgiveness is giving up all hopes of a better past and that the sense of forgiveness is really critical. And then finally, connectedness to people and planet. So this is her kind of approach to a sense of happiness. And then we have uh, this idea of there being different types of happiness. And this again comes from Dan Buettner. So he talks about experience happiness, and these are all things we can self-assess on a regular basis because these are very measurable. So experienced happiness is just a sense of feeling happy, having a positive affect. And we can measure this by how often we've smiled, laughed, or felt joy during the past 24 hours. Eudonomic happiness is about pursuing our passions. It's this uh, sense of place in the world, and that can be measured by whether we've learned or done something interesting yesterday. And then finally, he talks about evaluative happiness, which is really a life satisfaction score. And <clears throat> he talks about giving that a rating. Um, so rating our satisfaction with our life on a scale from zero to 10. This question, how close are you to living your ideal life on a scale from zero to 10 is the very first question I ask every single new patient that comes in to see me. So I start them right off with this. And they're usually taken a little bit aback, but the answers I get are incredibly interesting and so helpful and valuable to the patients. So consider asking yourselves and your patients these questions. And then I think ultimate happiness is breathing a sense of wonder, sacredness, and true understanding into one's perception of the world, into one's relationships, and into one's actions. Okay, so good, good, good enough, but can we really be happier? So there's this concept of a set point, and we used to think that you came into this world, you were either happy or not, and that's what you were stuck with. But in fact, we now know that intentionality contributes quite a bit to our happiness. Yes, circumstances affect our sense of happiness as well, but intention plays a big role. It's estimated by psychologists that about 40% of our happiness is due solely to our intention to be and to experience happiness. So this idea of a set point used to be that we have this set point of happiness and good stuff happens, we get happier, bad stuff happens, we get less happy and we just kind of vacillate around this set point. But actually what we've determined is that we can raise or lower that set point. So our vacillations can get higher or lower. And this has to do with this incredible field called neuroplasticity. And just you know, to put this into context, remember that our brain's capacity for learning is tremendous. We have 100 billion neurons, a trillion glial cells, half a quadrillion synapses. There's a lot of opportunity to think about things differently and to experience things differently. And in neuroplasticity, the idea is that we establish neural networks or firing patterns that are built upon our experiences, particularly as a young person. And those get re repeated and kind of hardwired in. But with awareness or with, as Petraea King called, with responding instead of reacting, we can bring an element of consciousness to our living and actually change the neural networking. And the more often we do that, we can reestablish new neuronal networks, and that essentially is neuroplasticity. So <clears throat> these neurologists talk about neurons that fire together, wire together, and that really tells us that this is a practice and this is something that we need to, if we want, bring into our lives on a regular basis. So just for you chemistry geeks out there, we'll get a little scientific for a moment. So when we, uh, biochemically, there's a lot that's going on when we're experiencing uh, something in our environment. So first, when we <clears throat> are choosing to uh, respond instead of react, we are giving ourselves the opportunity to see something in our environment in a new way. And a new experience causes the release of dopamine. 
Dopamine is really an important happiness hormone. Dopamine signals the hypothalamus to produce oxytocin, which is stored and re-released by the pituitary gland. And we're all familiar with oxytocin as the love hormone. It's the hormone that helps us feel comfortable and cozy and the world is safe and everybody in it is okay. <clears throat> and oxytocin and that oxytocin feeling is supported by serotonin, also released by the pituitary gland. When dopamine is sustained in its release, which happens again, the more we have awareness about what we're reacting to, we actually can downregulate the amygdala, which normally is our fear barometer. So when the amygdala is firing on all cylinders, the world is scary and we're in protective mode and not in happy mode. So with the help of dopamine, we can re kind of calm down the amygdala, get more oxytocin released and stop responding from a place of fear and protectiveness and instead respond to, with a place of openness and receptivity. When dopamine is sustained in that manner, it also signals the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. I think of the hippocampus as sort of the brain stenographer. So it's literally like that old court stenographer sitting on the keyboard typing away everything that happens. And it, once it records it in that way, that is a really critical phase of hardwiring that new neuronal connection. And in doing that can reset our ability to re redo that neuronal pathway. So we start to develop a new way of responding. And serotonin kind of seals the deal and really helps to, to solidify that hippocampal recording, if you will. And then we engage the left prefrontal cortex, which overlays reasoning and recall to the emotional experience <clears throat> so that we can actually have some cognition about what we've experienced. And all of this uh, increases stimulation of an area of the midbrain called the nucleus accumbens, which has a ton of dopamine receptors. And when those receptors are bound by that sustained dopamine release, we, uh, it creates a feeling in the brain of agency, of hopefulness, of the ability to gain control over our environment. So there's very clear chemical pathways with that happen in association to this neuronal firing. This is kind of another way to look at the same situation. We have an experience, we pay attention to it. We, or if we don't pay attention to it, it's an unconscious reaction. It's dealt with by our brainstem and the autonomic systems that we have in place. And we essentially have a, an amygdala response. If, on the other hand, we pay attention to the experience, it will force the amygdala to downregulate, we'll start to get more serotonin, more oxytocin, we involve the prefrontal cortex, we overlay reasoning, and that's where we get these new neuronal networks. And we kind of strengthen this association with this dopaminergic system. Now, this all requires that, and, and by the way, uh, nerve growth factor is important in this too, that kind of makes those neuronal connections very tight and lasting. And <clears throat> this all requires a concept of salience. So normally we can go about our day, especially our work day, in sort of a fog, like we just don't see things as different or as new. This can happen even with our interactions with patients. It's just another patient with GERD. It's just another patient with whatever. And we really don't invoke our salience. We don't see or open ourselves to the possibility of this being an entirely new and fresh and different experience. But when we have that salience, we can initiate, that's the first sort of gate that opens the possibility of creating a new neuronal network. And I make a point of this because when we get to the dietary supplement part, there's some things that actually improve our ability to uh, experience salient reactions. Okay, so um, I want to take us on a little tour then of what it means to be happy and to commit to this pathway. And, you know, I want to just really uh, remind ourselves that a mind that is stretched by a new experience can never go back to its old dimension. So, you know, once you embark on this path, you are going to be forever changed and forever changing. And I think it's important that we ask ourselves the hard question, are you content with who you are, what you have, and what you do? Do you feel challenged but not overwhelmed? Do you feel worthy? Do you love? Are you loved? Are you trustworthy and kind? 
Are you present? Mary Oliver says it the best. Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? These are the questions I feel like as practitioners, we have taken an oath. We have said we are on this planet to help bring more healing into the world. So these questions I feel are integral to that oath. And yes, there are things that get in the way for physicians, especially. I think self-judgment is a huge Achilles heel for us. We are all striving so hard to be perfect, to know all the answers, to not make mistakes. And uh, this is a very, um, it's a difficult thing to really jump into this open query land when you're a perfectionist. Um, also, we feel a lot of shame, which Brene Brown writes a lot about, describes beautifully as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. I think this is sort of the uh, unhealed healer in us. And a lot of us come into the healing profession with shame as a very key motivator. And uh, we also encounter in our profession a lack of authenticity, caring more about what others think than really what we think is important. We're exhausted. That gets in the way. We work too hard and we don't allow ourselves to play. <clears throat> and sometimes we're just too busy to pay attention. So these are real barriers. I can't solve all these for you, but I think that it's important to acknowledge and to think about in our own lives what might be getting in our own way of being truly authentic, joyful practitioners. So take some time to think about these things so that you can bring your fullest and most happy self to your practice. And now I want you just to sit back. I'm going to tell you some stories. <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about attributes to a happy practitioner. Again, kind of sharing my own experience as we go through. This is the passion flower plant, which is crazy looking and amazing and exemplifies this sense of passion. And, um, you know, many years ago, I was practicing as a primary care provider in Washington State where naturopathic doctors are listed and qualified to be primary care providers. So I had all the stresses of primary care. And I got to a point where I actually started to resent my patients. I would have somebody on the books for an annual exam. And while they were in the appointment, they would talk about the fact that they had this cough or this rash. And I would be like, what the heck are you? How dare you come in with complaints? during what should be a routine annual exam. And I started to get irritated at my patients for having problems. And I realized something was very wrong and I had lost my sense of passion. And I had this gift uh, of an experience where I would ride my bike to and from work at that time. And I was riding my bike home and I was riding past this field and I was daydreaming. And then I immediately had this visceral sense that I was in my daydream. And in my daydream, I saw myself as a very old woman, kind of your classic crone. I had gray hair. I was wearing kind of long flowy robes. I was mixing some herbs in a clay pot. And I realized that in that archetypal figure that I was a healer, that I was truly a healer. And that in that moment, I felt nothing but compassion, compassion for myself, compassion for the world, compassion for the people in my life. And I came out of that daydream very changed. And even now, as I talk about it, I can immediately put myself back into that moment. And I realized as a result of that vision that my practice was exactly that. It was a practice. I was practicing to be a healer. I'm not a healer yet. I can tell you that full out, but I'm on my way to becoming that crone and uh, that I have to practice every day. But essential to practice is to remember my passion and my compassion for the people that uh, are, I'm privileged enough to interact with as patients. So this is, I think, a key element. Love is another one. Um, and I'll talk about my father here. My father died of pancreatic cancer uh, about, um, what are we in, 2020? So just about four, 15 years ago now, wow. Um, and when he was dying, he continually lost the ability to do things. So he lost his ability to travel. <clears throat> and then he lost his ability to breathe on his own. So he was tethered to an oxygen tank. And then he lost his ability to think clearly, so he couldn't write anymore. And it was like an onion that was just peeling off layer after layer after layer. 
In the last few weeks of his life, he was down to his very core, and what was at his core was love. And I can only describe that when you walked into his room where he was sitting with his oxygen tank, listening to his classical music, all you felt was love permeating the room in this tremendous force. And it was a really profound experience for me because I was able to witness that at our very core, when we have nothing else left, all that we have is love, ultimately. And uh, since then, I have never forgotten that and really seek to find that core in people and to give it some air and let it come forth. Courage to be authentic is another one. Uh, this one is interesting. So for me, this brings me back to when I was working at a cancer hospital and I had just writ written this book, Definitive Guide to Cancer, which, by the way, was not my title. That was forced upon us by the editors. So here it was, Definitive Guide to Cancer, an integrative treatment approach. And I'm like, oh, my God, I am totally a fraud. I know nothing about cancer. I know nothing about integrative medicine. I was afraid to do radio interviews. I was afraid to talk about the book. I was afraid to tell people I'd written the book. I had completely lost my authenticity and my courage to be authentic. And what really was happening was I was setting myself up to be a perfectionist in this area. And it was only until I stepped back and I realized, yeah, I don't know everything about cancer. I certainly don't know everything about integrative medicine. And I just can offer what I can offer. And I'm a tool as much as anybody. And here's what I have put together. And it was only then that I clawed my way back to being more authentic in myself. But it was a very painful time in my career, I can tell you. And I think probably we've all had experiences like that. Forgiveness, again, I want to talk about this quote, forgiveness is giving up all hopes of a better past. <clears throat> and I'll share a story of a patient I had many years ago. This was an older man who uh, came in with stomach cancer. And at that time, all he wanted from me was cranial sacral therapy. So he would come in every week and he would lay down on the table and I would do a cranial sacral treatment and he hardly said a word. He would answer in monosyllables and really didn't tell me much about anything. And then one day he came in and I started the treatment and he started to sob, just sob on the table. And I said, you know, what's wrong? And he kept saying, I couldn't see her. I just couldn't see her. If I had seen her, I would have stopped. I couldn't see her. If I'd just seen her, I would have stopped over and over like a mantra. And finally, he started to tell me a story, which was that two years prior to this, he was leaving for work. He was backing his car to the driveway, and his young four-year-old daughter ran out behind him, and he ran over her and killed her. And he was ripping himself apart with guilt and grief. But in that moment, he kept saying, if I had seen her, I would have stopped. If I had seen her, I would have stopped. And finally, he stopped saying this, and there was this quiet, peaceful feeling in the room. He died a few weeks later, but I feel like he died with his grief, but not his guilt. And I think he had finally given up his guilt over killing his daughter. And what a tremendous thing to have done. I don't know if I could have gotten where he did. And then I move on to service. Service, I think, is, you know, important. And this is really something that we all do, but really to be of service in a deeper sense, I feel like means to show up. And what I mean by that is to not go through the motions of being there for our patients, but to really show up as a human being in the room with the other human being or human beings in the room with us and to have a moment of shared humanity. And when we're of service on that level, we reach our highest calling, I think, as physicians. And I think about, you know, dramatic examples of this, like Harriet Tubman, who had narcolepsy, head injuries, uh, you know, pain, constant pain, and yet she went back into the South, the violent South, and rescued hundreds of people to freedom. I mean, that's the kind of service that I think exemplifies this idea of common humanity. And then there's joy. 
Now, joy, I think, really is about exuberant, ecstatic living, even if it's not very good for you. This is me and my mom smoking a couple of cigars. And yes, cigars are not good for us, and I don't do them all the time. But in this moment, we are super happy. And I think that joy requires the relinquishing of judgment. And that that's so hard to do, but so very important, especially when the world is so depressed and distressed. And then there's playfulness. This is also um, this is my brother and my sister. So we were taking a hike in New England, and my brother's son, a uh, teenager at the time, had his hoodie up, and he was grumbling and moping along, just grumpy and depressed. So we decided to lighten the mood, and we tried to pick my brother up. That lasted for about two seconds because he's full of muscle, my brother is. But I got my nephew out of his grumpiness, and it was just about being playful and not worrying about being ridiculous and silly and just having some fun. And then, of course, we need to be an example. And yes, this means walk our talk and try to eat a healthy diet, try to exercise and all that sort of stuff. And hey, we're perfectionists. We're going to get it right. But really what I think this means is to be able to relate to our patients where they are. And we've all had experiences that allow us to do this. So for myself, one of the things that I can uh, relate to in this way is that I was diagnosed with breast cancer back in 2008 and used an integrative approach. But one of the things that happened to me as a result of the chemotherapy that I received is that I developed a very rare and unusual type of peripheral neuropathy. So my hands and my feet were excruciatingly itchy. I had the most intense puritis you can imagine. It was so bad that I had, I would work at my desk with my feet in an ice bucket and my hands would be on ice pads and I would have to get them frozen and then I could type. And then when they started to thaw, I'd put them back on the ice pads. I slept on ice. I mean, I was in misery, and this went on for weeks. And I got pretty despairing, as you might imagine, because nothing worked that the oncologist had to offer. Nothing worked that I had from an integrative perspective. And I finally, in desperation, went to PubMed, and I searched and I searched, and I found a case report of this woman who had the exact same symptoms for two years. Oh, my God, I don't know how she did it. And her oncologist just decided because of some mechanism that he thought of to give her Zofran, which is typically used for nausea. So, and her symptoms went away. So I called up my oncologist. I said, you've got to give me Zofran. I don't have nausea, but I think it might help my neuropathy. And I took Zofran and it went away. And whew, thank goodness. But in experiencing that excruciating pain, when a patient comes to me and talks about their pain, I have a sense and experience in my own life that allows me to relate to their experience authentically. And I think being an example is really being about being authentic with our patients and uh, helping them to, through my own authenticity, my own declaration of, yes, I understand what pain's about and I've had pain too, to help them uh, kind of come through it as well. So I think being an example is, is uh, recognizing our shared humanity ultimately. And then, of course, time in nature. I'm a big nature freak, and I think we all need, we cra our souls crave the wildness of nature. It's so important, and when we don't spend time in nature, we get into kind of a nature deficit disorder situation, and it's really hard to find our sense of authenticity and wellness. So I hope that we can make sure we include this in our lives. So going back to Oliver Wendell Holmes, can we reconstruct ourselves into the happy healers that we are meant to be? I think we can if we allow ourselves to experience some of these things, to incorporate our life experiences into our practices and use this amazing phenomenon of neuroplasticity to get us there. So on that, I finally arrive at dietary supplements and <laughs> I want to talk about how we can grease the skids. How can we make neuroplasticity easier? Make it easier for our brains to take these experiences that have the potential to transform our lives. So we know that a healthy diet does this. People who eat healthily, meaning an anti-inflammatory diet, have less mood disorder, which means their amygdala is firing differently. You cannot relieve anxiety if you have a hyperactive amygdala. It just doesn't happen. 
So you have to, in order for people to truly experience decreased anxiety, you have to be changing the neurochemistry of the brain. And people who eat anti-inflammatory diets do have changed moods. In fact, as little, in as very little time, in 10 days, a Mediterranean style diet can improve mood and cognition. So this is kind of uh, necessary, but not sufficient, but certainly important. And within the diet, there are certain components of the diet, the very things we go to when we're feeling most unhappy, most burned out, most stressed, that make it worse. Glucose being one, uh, glucose and sucrose amplify the cortisol response to stress and uh, prevent the resetting of the HPA axis. And when the HPA axis is upregulated, so we have a lot of brain levels of corticotropin releasing factor, for example, we will have decreased serotonin, decreased oxytocin, and we just impede this potential for neuroplasticity. So sugar is not such a good idea. On the other hand, Serotonin foods are great. The banana's back, baby. It gets so maligned because of its glycemic index. But of all the foods, this is the one that has the most serotonin per amount. So that's kind of fun. And so do pineapples, kiwi, tomatoes, walnuts. These are particularly serotonin-rich foods. But frankly, all plant foods have some serotonin precursors in them. And think about our neurotransmitter synthesis and remember that to make serotonin or dopamine, we need to have sufficient iron, magnesium, calcium, folic acid, B6, vitamin C, zinc. And without those things, we are just impeding the very process that we're trying to engender. So this is such a simple, simple fix. And there's some fascinating studies on populations that uh, when they're supplemented with some of these vitamins, for example, there's a lot of prisoner studies. And when prisoners obtain these nutrients, not only do they have improved mood, but they commit fewer offenses. So their aggression, their sense of fear is decreased. This is true in children. This is true in basically any population we study. So just something as simple as making sure we're replete in cofactors can go a long way. And uh, caffeine, although it feels good in the moment and has its benefits, if somebody is prone to anxiety, is clearly going to aggravate anxiety. So just be mindful about caffeine as an antidote. It's, you know, the high that we get from caffeine is maybe temporarily okay, but it's not really creating these new neural networks that we're looking for. Okay, so now this is the cool thing. L-theanine, which is derived from green tea, it's an amino acid. Now, you'd have to drink probably a vat of green tea to get uh, therapeutic amounts of L-theanine. So, you know, yes, there's some value in just drinking tea for L-theanine, but this is really best as a supplement. So L-theanine specifically increases dopamine. This is so critical for neuroplasticity and serotonin and GABA, and it generates alpha waves, which are the kind of wave pattern that meditators have. So you get this relaxed state of mental alertness, perfect for forming new neural networks. And importantly, l has been shown to increase the brain's capacity for salience, which is that thing I talked about at the beginning, the ability to see and experience our world differently and to respond instead of react. So l is uh, kind of a perfect <laughs> amino acid to support neuroplasticity and therefore um, ultimately happiness. Phosphatidylserine is another one that I think about in this regard. Phosphatidylserine um, reduces epinephrine and norepinephrine and it supports dopamine. So this to collectively will allow us to respond to new experiences with less anxiety and will therefore by facilitate the potential for oxytocin to predominate in our reaction, serotonin to predominate in our reaction, and to create these new neural networks. So phosphatidylserine is very important on that level. And it's also been studied a lot in relationship to the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis <clears throat> and blunts the um, ACTH response to stress. You can see up here in this graph, this is a normal response to a stressor where the ACTH shoots up and triggers the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Under the influence of phosphatidylserine, it's significantly blunted. So it takes more to stress us out. And uh, in, the nice thing about 
phosphatidylserine is that it doesn't require a lot. Just four milligrams is as effective as higher doses. And four milligrams is usually one capsule. So this is a very easy, not very expensive medication uh, supplement to consider. Sam E, of course, uh, has a role in this. Sam E donates methyl groups to both dopamine and serotonin, the two key neurotransmitters involved in this neuroplasticity of happiness. And we, it makes sense that studies would show that Sam E can relieve depression. Remember, if you're prescribing Sam E, it's really important to take it and prescribe it with a B complex, ideally with a B complex of methylated B vitamins because otherwise SAMe is a direct precursor within methylation to homocysteine. And if you build up homocysteine too much, you can actually create more inflammation in the body, including neuroinflammation, and it can kind of backfire on you. So you want to make sure you're helping push methylation all the way through with a B-complex. So SAMe with a B-complex dosage ranges anywhere from 800 to 1600 milligrams a day. And usually I would start actually at the high end and help people kind of get to a place where they experience their mood differently and then titrate them back. Other people start low and build up. It's kind of a personal preference. So now I want to get into herbs because I love herbs, and these are what I call my happiness herbs. Uh, the first one is holy basil, and this is a fabulous happiness plant. This is known as Tulsi uh, in the Ayurvedic condition. Uh, tradition. It's part of the mint family. The volatile oils in basil, holy basil, give it a lot of its medicinal properties. Uh, this is considered an adaptogen. It's also an antimicrobial and um, used traditionally for anxiety and stress. And it's been shown in clinical studies, in fact, to reduce anxiety, to reduce feelings of stress. But there's a really interesting sort of reported finding in some of these studies where the participants describe subjectively their experience after taking holy basil, and they describe having an increased motivation, an uh, increased sense of agency, uh, basically to re-engage in their life in a different way and to approach whatever difficulties they have with a renewed vigor. And that's something that I really like about holy basil and I see in people who take it. So as a happiness herb, holy basil is mentally clarifying, it increases this focus that we need to really move ourselves to a different place. It facilitates a shift in our perspective, relieves, of course, some mental inertia and depression, and restores ultimately the sense of hope and optimism. Okay, holy basil is one, and lots of ways to dose it. You can buy it as standardized extracts. I would encourage you, if you can, to experiment with the tincture because the broader profile of constituents, I think, really supports this more, the, the greater, the broader activity of holy basil. But any way you want to use it, it'll work. Okay, next is lavender. Lavender is, of course, one of the supreme anxiolytics that we have in the herbal materia medica. Uh, many human clinical trials on lavender and anxiety, systematic reviews on lavender and anxiety, and it works. It works, uh, let's see, as an example, this is one study. In this study, and this is very typical of the studies that you see, Selexin being a branded ingredient. This is a lavender essential oil that's been formulated for internal use. And uh, this is available in the US only in one brand and it's called WS1265. And I can tell you the brand when we're done with the CME part. Um, but this anxiety, uh, sorry, this uh, Selexin or this lavender essential oil in all these studies basically works better than placebo, which is important because there's a big placebo effect in anxiety and depression studies. And it works um, better than anxiolytics. And the responder rate in these studies is what's key. So if you look here, the responder rate's about 77% in this study. And the remitters, so people whose anxiety completely resolves is at 60%. This is a very reliable plant. I use this as my go-to for anxiety because I'm pretty sure it's going to work in most patients. So as a happiness herb, lavender relieves anxiety, but it replaces it with this sense of sereneness, this sense of calmness, increased resistance to stress, peacefulness. Uh, these are the, the attributes that I see in people when they take lavender. And then we come to St. John's wort. 
which uh, is, you know, basically the poster child for drug herb interactions. So it gets kind of put in the discard pile, but please don't put it in the discard pile. Yes, don't use it if people are taking medications that require cytochrome 3A4 for the metabolism. But otherwise, please think about St. John's wort. This is a beautiful plant. This has been used forever to ward off depression. Back in the old medieval Europe, they called depression evil spirits. And St. John's wort was used to ward off evil spirits or essentially to alleviate depression. So we've done this for a long time with this plant. Uh, this is a very effective anti-depression depression herb, but it also has some anxiolytic properties. So it's really particularly good for people who have kind of that mixed presentation of depression and anxiety. So they have depression, but they're, they're in, they have some insomnia. They're restless with it. They're agitated. They're irritable. That's kind of perfect for St. John's wort. And the studies are significant. These are just the two most recent meta-analyses, and there are many meta-analyses. And in all the meta-analyses, St. John's wort, and pretty much always the dose used is 300 milligrams of a standardized extract, standardized to 0.3% hypericin. That's usually what you're going to find on the market. But in all these studies, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe depression, St. John's wort outperforms placebo and has equivalence with with uh, standard SSRIs, tetracyclics, tricyclics. But the big advantage is no side effects, essentially no side effects. So very well taught. Why this isn't first line treatment for depression is beyond me. There is a slew of evidence to support its efficacy and so well tolerated. So as a happiness herb, think about the plant. The plant is, uh, has these leaves which are naturally perforated. You can see the holes in them. And those, those holes literally let the light in. And that's what St. John's Word is about. It's like letting the light into your soul, letting you see, then feel the lightness of being that we all deserve to, ex to experience. So this is particularly good for people who have lost a sense of hope, who have just kind of uh, lost their way in the darkness of their life and or down there gathering their treasures and have forgotten to come back up. This is a really good time for St. John's wort. And as I said, lots of doses available to you. Um, I don't know why I said 180 milligrams. That's a weird dose. That should have been 300 milligrams. Um, but this, the only thing you do have to be careful uh, about St. John's wort is that there is a small percentage of people, about 2%, who uh, can experience photosensitivity when they're taking therapeutic doses of St. John's wort. So it lets the light in so much that they get photosensitive. So just be a little bit careful with uh, making sure people are mindful about sunblock and so forth if they're taking it. Uh, it's also true that people who have a history of bipolar disorder or hypomania should be cautious with St. John's wort, just as they should with SSRIs because it can trigger a manic episode. And then again, of course, it's an inducer of CYP3A4, so you need to be careful with combinations. Okay, I think this is my last happiness herb. This is Melissa, officinalis, lemon balm. This is, again, part of the mint family. A lot of volatile oils, so it's very aromatic. It's a beautiful smelling plant. If you've ever grown it, uh, you know what I'm talking about. And lemon balm um, has been used for a lot of things. One of the things that it has kind of a known niche for is its ability to uh, work with people of hyperthyroidism because it interferes with the binding of TSH to the thyroid cell membrane receptors and also inhibits the incorporation or the activity of iodothyronine deiodinase. Um, so it does have some applicability there, which is great. Um, and it also is a fairly potent antioxidant. So other indications for lemon balm include uh, reducing oxidative stress. So for example, people who have been exposed to radiation accidentally or who have jobs that put them at risk for radiation exposure, herbalists will often recommend uh, lemon balm. But as a happiness herb, this herb has an affinity for cholinergic receptors in the cortex and it improves cognition. So this is a way to really help that prefrontal cortex overlay reasoning on these new neural networks, which then helps us to recall these new ways of being in our world. So Melissa, again, kind of works on that tail end of this uh, neuronal networking. It does have a little bit of sedative qualities to it, so not doesn't make you sleepy, it just kind of calms you down a little bit. 
And it would be considered contraindicated in people who have hypothyroidism for the same reason that it's indicated in people who have hyperthyroidism. Um, there are some studies that have been done on Melissa that uh, demonstrate its ability to relieve uh, distress and to replace it with this sense of calmness and importantly to improve cognitive processing speed, which is that cortex action that it has. And as a happiness herb, uh, there's a pretty, I think, widely known way to talk about lemon balm, which is that it brings joy to the heart. And it really helps to create this relaxed, calm alertness, but in a joyful way. So people who are grieving, uh, they're, you know, in a kind of intractable way, often respond to lemon balm from that perspective. And this can be dosed in a variety of ways. I would encourage you to, to think about the tea or the tincture because it tastes yummy. It kind of has this combination of a mint and a lemon-like flavor. So my happiness herbs, holy basil, mentally clarifying, lavender establishes the safe serenity. St. John's wort lets in the light and renews hope and lemon balm brings joy to the heart. And of course, we wanna reinforce all this new brain chemistry by respecting ourselves, our colleagues, our patients, making sure we express gratitude to and for our patients and our colleagues by smiling, uh, maybe introducing some levity into our encounters with patients. I think with self-depreciating humor especially and uh, being kind and our teasing and uh, touching our pa patients professionally, of course, when we're allowed to do that again. And then ultimately practicing, maybe not random, but purposeful acts of kindness, because there's so many random acts of viol violence in our world. So once we become happy practitioners, this is my last little point, when we're happy, and I mean authentically happy, we have all this new brain chemistry and networks firing, and we exude different pheromones, our heart rate changes, and when we're in close contact with another person, there are neurons set up in their body to specifically mimic us. These are called mirror neurons, and their only purpose in life is to mirror somebody that we're paying attention to. So when we come into an encounter and when we feel happy and authentic and real and joyful, some neurons in our patients are gonna fire those same things and we'll start to synchronize. Heart rate will synchronize, pheromones will synchronize, and we'll start to give our patients a glimpse of what it feels like to be a happy person so that they come in, we're not just relieving their complaint, we're actually helping them replace their complaint with a sense of being uh, well-lived. Uh, and that I think is when we transform medicine. So as Emily Dickinson said, the brain is wider than the sky. And so may you infuse your practices with joy. And that's all I got for you. Please, thank you so, so much, Lisa. That was awesome. We have a tremendous number of questions. And since we're at the end of our time um, and we have about 15 minutes before um, Dr. Ann Kennard comes on, I picked a couple of my favorite questions. And then I, if you're okay with it, I was thinking we could email you the questions. Sure, absolutely. Can, okay, because a lot of really great questions. I don't want to miss any of them. Yeah. So two, two questions that came sort of bubbled up and repeatedly asked were um, about um, mixing different supplements. So a couple different people ask in different ways, can we take these all together? Um, is it okay to mix, mix and match? Um, and if not, how do you, how do you pick that first line um, supplement or herb? Please do mix and match. This is what makes herbal medicine so addictive because you get to be this little tinkering chemist. So you can completely mix and match. Um, remember that herbs especially are medicines that most of the world uses as their first medicine that our ancestors have used for many, many, many generations. They're generally play well together. They like each other. They reinforce each other. Our bodies like to see a bunch of them. So yes, uh, use formulas. A very common way to create formulas is with the use of herbal tinctures. So these are the liquid extracts because you can mix them well. So in the European tradition of herbalism, you start with a 100 ml bottle, and then you basically choose your herbs according to how much of each herb to equal ultimately 100. So typically in an herbal formula, you'll have a leading herb. 
which is usually about 50% or so of the formula. That's the kind of main indication for your patient. Then you support that leading herb with herbs that have overlapping actions, but add their own component to the formula. And then sometimes you put a blender in there, something that will sort of harmonize the formula like a circulatory herb. Um, or for example, ginger you might see uh, in some of those formulas or uh, anyway, there's some others. Crotagus uh, is another one. And then you dose it typically at about a teaspoon twice a day for most people, assuming you're using herbs like we talked about that are essentially non-toxic. But this can be really fun because you can personalize your formulas. Um, now, of course, if you don't have time and luxury or interest in doing that, there are dietary supplement companies that have created formulas for you. And these are formulas typically that have been put together based on research, uh, collective clinical experience, and many of those formulas work very well. So you're also, I would encourage you to experiment with some formulas too. Thank you. Um, the last question is about kids. We have a lot of pediatricians and family docs on here. And it's sort of a two-parter. One, um, which is your favorite to use with kids? And is there a dose adjustment needed? So um, my favorite happiness herb for kids, without a doubt, is chamomile. And um, chamomile is so gentle and it's so, um, kids, kids just really respond to chamomile. And uh, you can do it in a lot of fun ways. Like my favorite way is to take chamomile, make a tea out of it. So remember when you're making a tea medicinal, you always want to steep it covered. So all the volatile oil components recondense on the inner lid, go back into the tea. And so make a tea like a heaping, let's say, teaspoon of chamomile flowers, put it in some hot water, steep it covered for about 15 minutes, and then strain it, and then pour it into ice cube trays. And as it starts to freeze, when it's frozen enough to hold a, pot, a little toothpick, stick toothpicks in there, and then you basically have chamomile popsicles that kids really like. And you can sweeten them a little bit with, you know, whatever you want to use as your sweetener. Um, and that's great for kids. Kids like chamomile tea. Um, so that works really well for, chem for kids. Um, I would say that the other one that's not an herb is L-theanine. And I find L-theanine is so great for kids. Um, and it really helps to allay anxiety and agitation in children. It's been studied in kids with ADHD uh, in young boys. I think it was between the ages of eight and 12. The dose used was 200 milligrams twice a day. So you're fine at like 200 to 400 milligrams in children. In general with herbs, um, there's a rule. Let's see if I can get this formula right. You take the kid's age and then you uh, add 12. Do I have this right? <laughs> And then you divide that number by the kid's age, and that's kind of the uh, fraction of the adult dose that you use. But more, uh, just generally speaking, like young infants, you just use tiny bits. And then when kids are generally speaking with herbs, between the ages of about 6 and 12, you generally use about half the adult dose. And then once they're in their teenage years, their metabolism is so high, you can go right up to adult dosing. That's just a very blanket statement, but holds true more or less. Thank you so much. I've been um, capturing all the questions and I'll organize them and send them to you. And um, I just want everyone to know that uh, we have posted Liz Lisa's PowerPoint on the event schedule. Um, so if you look at the shin details, those will be posted as well as the handouts. Um, and I just wanna say thank you again for being here. You're welcome, my pleasure. Please have a happy conference.